Good morning and welcome to Severn. There is a, uh, for whatever reason, a whole lot of people in the house of God this morning that I don't think I've had the pleasure of meeting. And so my name is Ryan Cox and I'm the pastor here and I want to welcome you if you're here for the first time or the first time in a little while to uh, week 17 of our series from the book of First Corinthians called Undivided. And on week 17, we've just been kind of rolling through this book. We're, uh, we're rapidly coming to a close here. On week 17, we find ourselves in uh, definitely one of, um, maybe if not the most famous section of the Bible. And I promise you, I promise you, if you've been to a wedding, you have heard this before. We're in uh, the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 through 8. And so I'm going to... Um, I'm going to read that and we're going to see what God has to say this morning. It says, If I speak human or angelic languages but do not have love, I am a sounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I donate all my goods to feed the poor, And if I give my body in order to boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy, is not boastful, is not conceited, does not act improperly, is not selfish, is not provoked, and does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. This is God's word. So obviously, uh, really couldn't be any more straightforward. This passage and what we're going to be talking about all morning today uh, is, is this idea of love. Um, it's interesting to me, and you can look this up, that in the, uh, just a few years ago, Google will put out uh, the number one most searched phrases or words. And just a few years ago, the number one most searched phrase on Google was, what is love? And that, uh, that makes perfect sense to me. And I, I think if you look around, you can see why that makes sense. Because if you look in our culture at the way that people treat each other, if you, if you pay attention to um, the way that people speak to each other on social media, the, the things that we are taught to value and the lengths that people are willing to go in order to get the things that they want, even if that means hurting other people, the only thing that's clear about the world that we live in is that people are quite unclear about what love actually is. Here's why this is really important to remember. Um, in the gospel of John chapter 13, Jesus did something unthinkable, unthinkable, that if you were there to witness in the, in that day and you sort of understood all the cultural implications of what was being done, it may be one of the most shocking things that Jesus did in his ministry. He washed the feet of his own disciples. This was the work of the lowliest of servants. And yet it was done by, it was performed by the King of Kings in, in John chapter 13. And uh, after Jesus washed the feet of his disciples, he had what, what has gone on to be known quite famously as the Last Supper with them. And it was at this supper that Jesus prophesied that one of his own disciples, Judas, would betray him. And, and he looked at Judas across the table and he said, what you are going to do, do quickly. Uh, and as, as uh, Judas left the room, Jesus right after that said the words that I'm about to read. But just, just consider this for a moment and try to get where try to get where they were almost 2,000 years ago. As Judas walked out of that room that night, Jesus knew that a chain of events had been set into motion that would lead to his capture, his torture, and his murder. He knew that beyond shadow of a doubt. He knew that before he came to earth as a baby. He knew that in an eternity past before mankind was even a thing. And of all the things that Jesus could have left ringing in the ears of his disciples, here's what he said. I give you a new command. Imagine if I was a disciple, I would have leaned in there. Jesus said, I give you a new command. Here it is. Love one another. Just as I've loved you, you must also love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples. 
Not if you attend church 52 times a year, not if you give your money sacrificially to a local church or a charitable organization, not if you have untold amounts of scripture memorized, not if you try really hard to not smoke, drink, cuss, or chew, or run with girls who do, or whatever you think a good person is. Jesus said, by this, people will know you're my disciples if you have love for one another. So out of the, out of the words Out of the mouth of the Son of God himself, the distinguishing mark that would either confirm or deny your and my claim that we actually follow in the footsteps of Jesus, it would be validated by the love that we have for each other. So for a culture that really doesn't have, according to Google even, really doesn't have any idea about what love is, I would say, based on what we read scripturally, it's uh, it's vitally important that, 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 uh, that we remember and that we understand what this thing called love really is. And so, to quote the early 90s artist Hathaway, what is love? Joke killed at the 9 a.m. too. I'm glad it landed here. Um, We're going to answer that question, actually, to start out this teaching. The answer to that question, what is love, uh, is going to be our first idea today, and, and, and hopefully you understand as we get moving why we need to start here. But our first idea is... Number one, love is a gift. Now, a a lot of times when you talk about a gift, you think about like a Christmas present that you have all kind of warm and fuzzy feelings over and you're really thankful for. That's not what we mean. That's not what the Bible really means when it refers to a gift. If you were here last week, uh, last week we started uh, this whole idea that we're still carrying forth today in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And in 1 Corinthians 12, the topic of spiritual gifts was brought up. And so there were three big ideas that we pulled from this idea of spiritual gifts. Number one, God authors our gifts. Number two, purpose accompanies our gifts. But number three, community unlocks our gifts. Now, we didn't have time to roll through the entirety of the second half of um, of chapter 12, but if you read the end of chapter 12 that leads up to chapter 13, which we're in today, here's what you will not read. Paul does not say, okay, this concludes our teaching on the spiritual gifts. Let's go ahead and shift gears here and talk about love for some odd reason. The reason Paul does not say that, you won't find that at the end of chapter 12, is because he has not changed the subject here. And the fact that in this section of this letter, um, that's all about spiritual gifts, the fact that in this section we're reading about this thing called love shows you and I, what it should show you and I is that love is a spiritual gift. And the way that the Bible defines a gift, what it literally means in the Greek is a favor that one receives without any merit of his own. In other words, when we say that love is a gift, when we think about this idea right here, what the Bible is really teaching you and I is that you and I are completely powerless to produce this in our own lives. We are completely powerless to make our heart a loving heart. We're really, we're, we're, we're powerless to, to produce everything that 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is talking about. And there's a reason for that. Because when, when, when we talk about love, what love deals with Love deals with something that is deeper than the things that you and I can control in our lives. So you and I do actually have a measure of control over our own lives. We have the ability to restrain ourselves, at least temporarily. We have the ability to at least periodically modify our behavior, and I can prove that. When you go to work tomorrow morning... Uh, and, and you get a case of the Mondays and, and one of your coworkers starts popping off of the mouth to you and you really want to punch him in the face for doing so, here's what you can do. You can physically restrain yourself from punching said coworker in the face. You have that power over your own life. What you don't have the power over is your burning desire to punch them in the face. And that's what this chapter is dealing with. When we talk about love, love deals with something deeper than our surface level behavior. It deals with with things that you can't just decide to change. It deals with your motives. I can preach a, a, a biblically enlightening sermon on why you should have good motives behind the things that you do, but you can't just decide to not be self-centered in the things that you do anymore. Love deals with your motives. It deals with the desires of your heart. It deals with your heart generally. And for all the things that you and I have the ability to do and modify and change and exert power over, one thing the Bible's remarkably clear about is the reality that you and I can never, no matter what we do, no matter how much we desire it, we cannot change our own hearts. What love is at the end of the day, it is, and it only is, it only is the byproduct of God changing your life. 
It is the outworking of a supernaturally changed heart. That's what it means that love is a gift. And not only does this passage show us love is a gift, it shows us how unthinkably important this gift is. That's what we read in the first three verses here. Walk with me through, through verses one through three. Paul says, if I speak in human or angelic languages but do not have love, I'm a sounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I can move mountains but do not have love, I'm nothing. And if I donate all my goods to feed the poor, and if I give my body in order to boast, or some of your versions might say to be burned, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Just pause there. What Paul is doing in, that, in those entry-level verses, he's comparing love to some of the other spiritual gifts. And he's specifically comparing them to the gifts that the Corinthians valued the most. That being prophecy and the gift of faith. See, the, 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 the whole reason that there's even a section in the first Corinthian letter about spiritual gifts is because 2,000 years ago, the Corinthians had really wrong ideas about them. And what they had determined in their local church was that some gifts were really important and some gifts really didn't matter at all, meaning then that the people who had those important gifts were important and nobody else really mattered. It was a very ugly thing and it was really tearing the church apart. So what Paul is aiming at here is the two gifts, prophecy and faith, that the Corinthians kind of decided were the most important ones. So when Paul talks about the gift of prophecy, when he says, if I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, that's Paul's way of describing an unbelievably gifted teacher. That's Paul's way of describing somebody who um, has the ability to open up God's word and see things that no one else is able to see. This is just somebody that God has given an unreal amount of insight to and, and who can then turn around and not just see it for themselves, but they can communicate the truth of God's word in a way that just holds a captive audience, you know, melts faces. From the moment he opens his mouth, you, you, you can hear a pin drop in the audience. That's what Paul's talking about there. And, and when Paul talks about if I have the gift of faith that can move mountains, um, th there's a difference biblically speaking. There's a difference in the Bible between faith that every believer needs in order to be saved. We all need to have faith in Jesus if we want to be saved. There's a difference between that faith that every believer has and then the spiritual gift of faith. The spiritual gift of faith is, is the ability to see something before anyone else can see it, to believe that God could cause it to pass, and to really inspire people and move them to action. And, and it's, not a, it's not a very common gift, but one of the people that we see clearly had in his scripture was Nehemiah, if, if you're familiar with that story at all. Nehemiah was a guy that was you know, thousands of miles removed from his homeland, and he got word that, that the, the wall around his, his homeland, his homes, the, the capital of his homeland, Jerusalem, was broken down and that was a really big deal back then it kind of indicated a lot of shame and so Nehemiah was moved with this passion to unite people because he believed that, that a group of people could come together overcome adversity discouragement opposition all of it and build this wall and begin to get God's people on the right track and through the vision that God gave him and his belief that God could cause it to, to come to pass he rallied people to a cause he kept them on track when they started the waiver and he got that wall built that's what the gift of faith is um, um, and it's a, really what it is, it's a leadership gift. And, and so these two gifts that Paul's driving at here, not only were they the most highly sought after gifts in Corinth, but if you think about it, it's no different today. Right? The people with an, an unbelievable prophetic gift or an unbelievable leadership gift were people that in the church at Corinth, you know, everybody looked at them and said, man, that must, that must be a great example of a godly person because look at the talent they have and the gift that God's given them and the way that God used them. And it's no different today. Because when you have like a pastor of a giant church standing on a big stage and he's pumping out New York Times bestsellers left and right and there's millions of people turning it, tuning into his podcast, the reason that people tend to idolize pastors today is because they're incredibly gifted in those two areas. The ability to teach extraordinarily well and the ability to lead. And you know, right, wrong, or indifferent, what people do is they tend to idolize those people and put them on a pedestal and look to them as the end all be all of some kind of perfect demigod individual. And then when they fall from grace, it's a big deal and kind of leaves everybody in the wake. But what Paul says about those two gifts, 
right in verse 2 here, would have really taken the wind out of the Corinthian people. Because when he talks about an unreal gift of prophecy and an unreal gift of leadership, Paul doesn't say those are incredible gifts. And if you just add some love to them, they'll be even more effective. Paul says, if you have those gifts... The ability to explain God's word and the the ability to lead people. Even if you have those gifts, but you don't have love, Paul says you are absolutely nothing. He he goes a step further in verse three and he says, and if I donate all my goods to feed the poor, and if I give my body in order to boast, but don't have love, I gain nothing. Nothing. So if in verse two, if Paul's talking about gifts and talents you can have while not having a heart that's been supernaturally changed, now he's talking about things you can do, actions you can perform while not having love in your life. And he he talks about, first off, somebody who was so ridiculously generous, they don't just give some of what they they have away. This This is a person that he describes, donate all my goods to the poor. This is a person so moved with the plight of the homeless that they, they give away everything to the point that they themselves become impoverished in order to help other people out of their poverty. Now, we make a very big deal out of giving 10% to the church, 10% to charity, 10% to whatever. Paul's describing someone there who gives every, everything away. Imagine even hearing about it. Imagine somebody in this church did that. I mean, word would travel like wildfire. That individual is homeless now. Why'd they do it? To get somebody else out of poverty. And then he, say, he talks about somebody that their, their generosity extends past their finances to their own life and they give up not just their things but their life. They give their own body because they're so courageous in their faith. They're so stalwart in their convictions. Now you'd be hard pressed. I mean when you think about what Christianity is supposed to look like or what spirituality or a good person or whatever is supposed to look like, you'd be hard pressed to find two actions more noble than the two actions Paul just zeroed in on here. But what he says, what he says would have shocked the Corinthian people. He says you can be unbelievably generous to the point that you give up your own life for your beliefs, but if you do it without love, it means absolutely nothing. And I guarantee you, I guarantee you, when this letter was read 2,000 years ago in the church at Corinth, it sounded a lot in their sanctuary like it does here today. And frankly, I think this would have been incredibly confusing because Jesus has so much to say about generosity and, and, uh, you know, having the poor on your heart like the poor is on God's heart and having a heart for the down and outer and being willing to sacrifice so that they could have more. Jesus talks so much about being courageous in your faith and not denying Jesus, even if, even if it costs you personally. And his example obviously was one of enduring unbelievable persecution. Paul says you do that without love. It doesn't mean anything to God. It doesn't mean anything at all. Now, there's two things that you and I can pull There's two things that you and I can pull from verses one through three. One of them's obvious. The second one is less obvious, but it's terrifying to me. The first one is, no matter what we do, if we don't have love, it means nothing. That's that's the obvious message there. Whatever gift you have, whatever talent you have, uh, whatever action you perform, without love, it means nothing. You can't argue with that. But the implication here that is straight up terrifying to me as I've sat on this for a week is that you can be incredibly outwardly good. You can be incredibly outwardly moral. You You can live a life of unbelievable generosity to the point that you lose your own life for your beliefs And you can have everybody fooled. You might even believe your own lies while God sees right through it and sees every one of your motives is shot. You do not have a heart that's changed by God. And in that moment, what you are is what Jesus described as a whitewashed tomb. Pretty on the outside, dead on the inside. You can do all of these incredibly outwardly moral looking things without having a heart that's been changed by God. That's terrifying to me. And and the question I think that that the Corinthians would have been asking that I ask there is, how could somebody be that generous? How could somebody be that gifted or talented and used by God, be that generous, be that courageous in their faith and have an impure motive? Why else would they do those things? And, And that's what Paul answers in actually the first verse here. He says, if I speak human or angelic languages but do not have love, here's what he says, I'm a sounding gong or a clanging cymbal. 
Now that imagery, you know, a sounding gong and a, and a clanging cymbal, it doesn't mean a whole lot to us living in 2017, but in Paul's day, they knew exactly what he was talking about. They knew exactly why he specifically drew that analogy there, because in the city of Corinth 2,000 years ago, just like all Greek culture, it was littered with idolatry. Everywhere you look, there was, a, there was a shrine or a temple to a false god, and the way that they would worship the false gods in Corinth was through what was called the procession. And it was basically a parade. And so people would get all dolled up and they'd be marching around the city. And, you know, the parades look different parade to parade. But the one thing that you always saw in every single one of those parades was what Paul talks about here. You'd always see gongs and cymbals. And what they would do is they marched through the city. They would beat on those gongs and cymbals until their arms just about came off. But they weren't doing it to honor their God. They weren't doing it to worship their God. They were doing it to try to get the attention of their God. They were doing it so that they could kind of coerce their God into answering their prayer, to um, you know, making them financially prosperous, to blessing them with a good harvest that year. Basically, they were just trying to get that God to do whatever they really wanted that God to do. It wasn't about service to him. It was just thinly veiled self-centeredness. And what Paul is explaining by using that analogy there, talking about how we can be, we can fool ourselves and maybe fool the people around us, but we really are just a a, a sounding gong or a clanging cymbal. What Paul is describing there, and this is where the Bible teaches elsewhere, parables of the prodigal son, you know, the teachings of Jesus, how he dealt with Pharisee. What the Bible is telling us is that there's a way in which we are inclined to go through life where we can try really hard to be a good person. We can try really hard to check the box and, and, and be an outwardly moral individual. Meanwhile, the motive for which we perform our good works is really the same broke down motive that those pagans had for worshiping their false gods 2,000 years ago. And all it is is thinly veiled self-centeredness. We're not doing it out of love and thankfulness for the God that saved us. We're not doing it for the, out, of, out of love and benefit you know, for the people around us. We're doing it simply because we want, we want God to, to bless us with a good life. We want, it, we want God to give us whatever we want. And we believe that our morality is a way of basically putting God in our debt. And in that moment, in that moment, what you are is a Pharisee by a biblical definition. I mean, you think about that. Pharisees had the first five books of the Bible memorized. The Pharisees were more outwardly moral, more outwardly righteous, more outwardly good than any of us will ever be. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, memorized. They can spout it off at the top of their head. I don't care if they have leprosy. If the church doors are open, a Pharisee's gonna be there 52 times a year. 10% of everything that they have, every profit that they make, every crop that they grow, regardless of personal cost, a Pharisee ponies up the tithe. They had 648 laws by which they governed every single moment of their lives. I mean, when the Son of God was promised, when the Messiah was promised to come to earth, everybody thought, well, the Pharisees are the people he's going to honor, he's going to speak kindly to, he might even give them leadership positions or something. But Jesus looked the Pharisees dead in the eye. He called them hypocrites. He said, your father is not God. Your father is the devil. And he did it for that same exact reason because their morality was just a pathetic attempt to manipulate God. And and what this idea shows us in just the first three verses of 1 Corinthians 13, what this shows us is what sets Christianity so radically apart from, not, not from other religion, but from religion itself. And this is our next idea today, that God is not after our hands, he is after our hearts. I, I've been hearing more recently, for whatever reason, uh, how common the idea is that Christianity says basically the same thing as every other religion. And actually a friend of mine from this church called me this week and was talking to me about an encounter he had with a coworker. He was trying to, you know, engage his coworker with his faith and just asked him. He said, you know, you've seen how it's changed my life and my family. Why wouldn't you give Christianity a shot based on what you see in me? And his, his friend, his coworker said, I just, I feel like it says the same thing as every other religion. I feel like it says the same thing as Buddhism. And as common an idea as that is in our culture, I would just ask you, if you've ever thought that before, if you believe that yourself or if you know someone else who believes that, let me just ask you, how could, could 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 1 through 3 possibly be in the word of God if that's true? 
the, the basic message of, of every religious system is the same. It might get you know, couched differently, but the basic message of religion is that if you live a good life, God owes you. He's gonna have to save you. He's gonna have to bless you. He's gonna have to answer your prayers if you just try enough. What the word of God has just said is you can be so generous that you have nothing left to your name. You can't be any more generous than that. You can be so generous, you give up your own life, the ultimate form of sacrifice, and you can still miss the boat. This is the fundamental difference between Christianity and religion because Christianity teaches that there is absolutely nothing that you and I can do to dig ourselves out of the hole that we find ourselves in. There's nothing that we can do to make God save us. There's nothing that we can do to save ourselves or pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. And to believe differently is to misunderstand the message of Christianity. And this is what Paul was trying to get the Corinthians to return to. And it's not that God doesn't care about our actions. It's that he's after our heart. Because what the Bible shows us is that when God has our heart, the actions always follow. The works always follow. A changed life will always follow. Why? Because when you understand what God has done for you and it grips you in your heart, it will always lead to a changed life. Only now you're serving him and you're loving other people. Not because you have to. Not to try to earn something, but just because you're so captivated by what God has extended to you, purely by his grace. And so the, the, the question that I'm sure the people in Corinth had 2,000 years ago was, okay, so if I can be this generous and still not have love, if I can give up my own life and still not have love, then what on earth does love actually look like? And that's what Paul answers for us in the, you know, the famous wedding, wedding Bible verses here in verses four through eight. He says, love is patient, Love is kind. Love does not envy, is not boastful, it's not conceited. It does not act improperly. It's not selfish, it's not provoked, and doesn't keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. We read, it's just so funny to me, we read those verses in you know, chapels and churches on wedding days and people swoon over them. I mean, people are moved by the poetic beauty of them and there is a certain poetic beauty in those verses and it causes people to, you know, tears roll down the cheeks, greatest day of my life sort of thing. The irony of that is that to the original audience that received those words, they were, the, they were, they were a stinging rebuke because as Paul explained to the Corinthians everything that love was like, what he was telling them by implication is everything that they were not like. And, and, and the, the Bible's definition of love, the common denominator that we see in everything that we read in verses four through eight is that love is about everything other than itself. It's the exact opposite of the way that our hearts are naturally inclined to go ever since we walked out on God in the Garden of Eden. It aims everything that it has at others. Love is patient toward others. Love is kind toward others. Love does not keep a record of the wrongs committed by others. And I, I tell you the most convicting thing about this, this description of love. If you read in verse seven, it says it bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, it endures all things. What it means that love bears all things is that regardless of, of, an, of an individual's shortcomings, Regardless of the pain that they have caused you in your life, regardless of their failure or their brokenness or whatever your relationship with them costs you, it bears with them. It assumes that, that their burdens are actually yours to bear as well. When, when it says that love believes all things, this means that love, what it looks like, it will always believe the best in another individual even when you have a mountain of evidence that would teach you otherwise. It always extends the benefit of the doubt. It never locks someone into a box that they could never change, that they're never gonna be anything other than their worst mistake. When it says that love hopes all things, it means that regardless of how someone has treated you, you always look to that individual and hope the best for them. And just to cap it all off, it says that love endures all things and never ends, meaning there's no expiration date on this thing. There's no point at which you cut your losses and say, hey, I'm not seeing any progress. I just can't do this anymore. It goes on without ending, without tiring, without running out of gas. 
And the way that the Bible talks about this thing called love, what, it, what, it, what it's showing you and I is this is not a love that pastors need to have. This is not a love that elders or deacons or small group leaders need to have. This is a love that every single person who has any desire at all to please God must have in their life. And unless you are the most arrogant and, and, and self-deceived person in the world, the only thing that you can do when you read verses four through eight is take a deep breath, step back, and realize that doesn't even come close to describing me. And if you think it does, I have two pieces of advice for you. Get married and have kids. <laughs> and God will very quickly show you how far you fall short of that. But just, I mean, honestly, take a second here and ask yourself. And, you, you, know, you know, don't answer me out loud because we already, already know the answer. Love is patient. Would you really consider yourself to be patient? How about this? Would the people closest to you really consider you to be that patient, that kind? When the word of God says that love keeps no record of wrongs, think about what that really means for a moment. Do you keep a record of wrong? Here's what just happened. Somebody came to your mind who's wronged you. You know what that proves? You keep a record of wrongs, hypocrite. <laughs> I mean, try to live that way for more than 30 seconds. You know, bear all things and, and, and believe and hope and endure all things and make sure that that kind of love never ends. The, 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 the looming question that this chapter has, I mean, begs us to answer. And if we can't find an answer, this is not good news, by the way. This is the saddest chapter in the Bible if this is where, where it stays. The looming question is how do you get this love? That the word of God says, without it, nothing you do means absolutely anything in God's eyes. It, it, it's, it's so, it was so telling to me. I, just, I, I read this one more time in the parking lot before the 9 a.m. service. You know what I found? There's not a single command in all of 1 Corinthians 13. There's not a single command. Paul talks about how important love is. He talks about what love looks like. He kind of talks about his own life by example. But this doesn't tell us that, to do anything because there is nothing to do here. You can't do love. It's the product of something that must first be done in you. So how is it that you and I receive this gift and live this kind of life? There's an answer to that question in this chapter that is so obvious, it's easy to step right over without realizing that you have. But if you read how Paul describes love you'll find something very odd. He says, love is patient and love is kind. He doesn't say love consists in patience or looks like kindness, even though that's how you would normally phrase that. And he goes on and he says things that even sound more strange. Love does not envy. Love does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness. It bears, believes, hopes, endures all things. When you zoom out from what's being said there, the question is, how could love be patient or kind? How could an attribute be conceited or not be conceited? How could an attribute keep a record of wrongs? How could an attribute bear anything or believe anything or hope anything or endure anything? You, an attribute can't do anything that Paul described in verses four through eight. An attribute can't do any of that, but a person can. A person can. And what Paul is doing in these verses is personifying love and talking about love like it's a person. And the reason that he does that is our final idea today. It's because before love is something that you can do, it has to be someone that you've met. The reason that Paul talks about love like a person in this chapter is because by God's design, that is the only way that love will enter your life. There's not a person on planet earth that will ever learn love by trying really hard. There's not a person on planet earth that will accidentally discover and grow in the ability to love. God has designed it so that you and I learn the ability to love and grow in that ability when someone enters into our life, picks us up, and loves us first. That's why the word of God plainly says the only reason that we love God and the only way that we can love God is because God loved us first. It's the proactive love of God that literally teaches us how to love him back. Because apart from that, you can't give God something that you have not first received. 
And so until love, until someone enters our life and fills our deepest need, the deepest corners of our heart with this love that God has designed us to need, what happens is even our good deeds will use to try to fill that need. And those good deeds in that case are self-centered. They're more about us than anyone else. And in that moment, we become a sounding gong and a clanging cymbal and it doesn't work. So where do you get this love from? As hard as we try, as hard as we try to do it, you and I will never receive this kind of love from another person. And if you try to look to another human being and demand this kind of perfect love from them, the only thing that you will do is crush them with the weight of your expectations. You cannot receive this kind of love from your parents, from your spouse, from your kids, from your closest friends. There's not an individual in history that can love you like this except for Jesus. And the reason that that, that Paul talks about love in this way, he's describing Jesus with this description of love. Because the gospel is, the good news that we talk about every seven days is that perfect love became a perfect person. Love was perfectly embodied in a person. And it can be perfectly found in an infinite supply in one person. And that person is Jesus. The Bible says love is patient. Who has been more patient with you than Jesus? The Bible says love is kind. Christ demonstrated his kindness to you in that while you were sinning against him, while you were living in active rebellion against him, long before his love made you beautiful or worthy or anything, Christ still died for you. And not only is his love a love that does not keep a record of wrongs, it's his love that erases the record of wrongs for his children that call on his name and put their trust in him. It's a love that sees every single area of our lives, everything in our past that we don't want to talk about, we don't want to think about, we don't even have the courage to confront. Jesus sees all of it and his love still says, come to me. Come to me if you're tired. Come to me if you're weary. Come to me if you're burdened. Come to me if you don't want to do what you've been doing anymore. And the one who comes to me with his head down looking for a savior, Jesus said, I will absolutely never cast them out. I don't think there's a chapter in God's word that causes you and I to come face to face with our total dependency on God more than 1 Corinthians 13, because you cannot do anything that this chapter talks about apart from God doing it in you first. And so the way that you and I grow in this love that the word of God says is so central and vital and necessary to living life the way God desires, you have to read this chapter. Before you read it primarily as something you need to do, you need to read it primarily as something that was done for you, that even though you didn't deserve it, even though you stood guilty and condemned before a holy God, one man, Jesus Christ, the God man himself stood stood in your place. He took the punishment that you deserved and through a relationship with him, this perfect love of 1 Corinthians 13 is yours in an infinite supply. And to the, de- the, de- the degree to which you and I grow in our understanding of that is the degree, the degree to which that love fills us, fills our need for love. And as we grow in that, as we preach that to ourselves, as we get into small groups with our Christian brothers and sisters and spur each other on in that love, it will fill us to the point of overflowing so that we can actually live this kind of life and extend this kind of love to the people that God has placed around us. That's what Christianity is. Amen? That's it. That's all.